زملائي اعضاء نادي هارفرد الكويت حضور الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Harvard Club of Kuwait alumni, honored guests, privilege tonight of introducing Dr. Hind Al Qadri, who will be giving a speech on climbing the career ladder. When I was thinking about how to introduce Dr. Hind, I was reminded of the way we met. It was uh, quite by accident. She had approached my father to give a keynote address at an event she was doing in Cambridge, but she had to do with me instead. When uh, I was thinking of a way to introduce her to you all in her uh, attention to detail, I remembered the quote by Ahmed Shawqi that said, العلم يرفع بيتا لا عماد له والجهل يهدم بيت العز والشرف Indeed, Dr. Hind has traveled far and wide to increase her knowledge and to raise pillars everywhere she goes. She has been receiving many accolades, deservedly, from Harvard University and L'Oreal, and I'm sure many more to come. She's an excellent ambassador to the talent Kuwait has to offer. And with that, I give you Dr. Hindal Qadri. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sabah, for the nice introduction. And I would like to thank Harvard Club of Kuwait for arranging this event and for giving me the opportunity to share my story and my experiences with you. Um, actually, um, I just realized that I'm giving a speech about climbing up the career ladder and I realized that I'm in a room with highly successful people who are already in the top of the career ladder. Uh, however, I am honored to uh, share with you my experiences, my story, and I hope that I'll be helpful to some of you who are still climbing the career ladder. Uh, so before I get started, uh, I just want to let you know that I am a person who is uh, more introverted, and you know, introverted people usually don't feel comfortable uh, talking about their uh, personal life, but I will step out of my comfort zone today and I'll share some aspects of my personal life. Uh, because I, um, I came to realize that the way that I was raised and the experiences that I've uh, come through uh, actually shaped me and made me the person who I have become today. Um, so I came from uh, an average Kuwaiti family. Uh, my father worked in the military. Uh, my mother uh, was a housewife. Um, even though she had a college degree, but, but she decided to uh, stay at home, uh, take care of her children. And I think she did a good job. So, uh, since my father worked in the military, we, um, or you can imagine how structured the like our discipline the household was we had certain rules and things that we have to do it on consistent basis like for example we have to uh, wake up at 6 a.m every day whether it's weekdays weekends holiday summer holiday we have to wake up at 6 a.m we have to go to, go to bed at 9, 9 p.m every day again weekends weekdays holidays um, Meals would be served in certain times. You can't uh, eat between meals. Uh, you can't cheat. Um, we can't eat from outside, so everything should be homemade food. Um, also, we had limitations in terms of t television watching. Um, we are not allowed to watch TV on weekdays, only on weekends. Um, and I remember we had to watch only Indian movie on Friday. This is the only thing that uh, I remember watching. Um, also, we did not have a maid, uh, not because my father couldn't afford having a maid. You know, in Kuwait, even below average uh, families could afford having a maid, right? But he thought that um, uh, that wasn't necessary, and he wants us to build this sense of responsibility. <clears throat> So my parents uh, put a lot of emphasis on uh, education and academic performance. Uh, my mother would uh, not only teach us the lesson for tomorrow, but for the week ahead. 
Uh, the teacher, is, of course, would be very happy with me. Um, I would answer all the questions. Uh, the teachers uh, would sign me up for uh, all kinds of competitions. I was part of the music band, the Quran competition, uh, grammar, poem, everything. Because they knew that um, my parents were committed, they would take me on weekends for uh, the competitions. After school, they would pre prepare me for uh, these competitions, and I would win uh, all the time. Um, so, um, um, so, yeah, the only uh, entertainment that I had at that time, or the entertainment that was available to us, is uh, books or reading. My father was a big fan of collecting books, so um, I would go to the library and I read all kinds of books. So I read, um, I remember all William Shakespeare books, Charles Dickens, Victor Hugo, Ajatha Christie, and others. Um, I read psychology book, history, religious, everything. And imagine when um, like six or seven years old uh, kid go to school and hear other kids talking about the show that they watched yesterday or the um, uh, brand watch that they bought from Paris or other things and I didn't have these things. Um, except that the books that I read or the competitions that I go for at the beginning, it was a little bit um, painful for me as I felt that I'm different. But over time, busy with all of these things, um, I developed this mindset that um, these things that other kids were talking about uh, didn't interest me anymore. I was busy, busy with other things. Uh, again, I didn't know what, how this happened, but I would give the credit to my parents. Um, so in, in high school, I think that I was looking up going to the medical or dental school. I wanted to be a doctor. Other girls talking about makeup or brands. Um, it didn't interest me anymore. So, uh, as I mentioned, I would give the credit to my parents. So, I went to the dental school. My dream was to be a doctor or a dentist, but I decided to go to the dental school. Uh, I went to the dental school in Egypt. I graduated. I started my career as a dentist. Uh, again, developing this mindset of not only to do the requirement, but also uh, go beyond that and try to improve myself, uh, become the best version of myself. Um, I tried to and learn more things. Uh, and, and as a dentist, it was a new thing to me. I would read, uh, attend workshops, and um, learn new techniques. And um, I was eventually promoted to a clinical supervisor. And uh, one of the um, first challenges that I have uh, faced in my career as a clinical supervisor, you know, every time when you, um, when you try to move up, there, there should be some challenges or some struggle. Uh, so um, after some time, so before um, I was working as a dentist, my only responsibility is the mouth or the oral cavity. I would only treat patient or looking at teeth. I, um, I excelled on that, and then when I became a clinical supervisor, I, my responsibility changed, so I have to deal with other things, bigger things, on a higher level. So at that time, um, I, I was aware of uh, some unethical issues in my workplace and some compromises that has been done. So. Um, I collected some evidence and I uh, reported to my boss at that time to do something about it. Um, however, um, nothing has been done and uh, I was in a position that uh, I did everything that I could to correct these things and to improve the, like these ethical, unethical behavior that was going around. Um, but I, I couldn't uh, make this work uh, because of the um, unsupportive, uh, the environment wasn't supportive, was unhealthy. So at this point, I uh, decided to leave. So sometime, I'm sure it maybe happened to some of you, you work hard, your best, you work your full integrity, and when there's no support, um, there's nothing to do, so just leave. So um, 
At this point, uh, transferring to another um, department wasn't an option. So I decided to apply for a post-grad program. So there was a post-grad program in Kuwait just established, and I applied. Um, I thought I was um, a good candidate for that because I had, um, I, I had a good reputation, um, I had good CV, uh, but unfor unfortunately I was rejected. I think the story got viral in the social media. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, so, um, to imagine my position now, um, I'm stuck in my workplace. I was asked not to do anything regarding these unethical issues. Uh, I can't perform my job as a dentist and a clinical supervisor and I was rejected from the board, and I felt that I'm paralyzed, I, I can't do anything. Uh, it was a reflection moment for me. Um, that sometimes you just don't know what to do. Um, I start to think uh, out of the box, so, and try to be positive also. Um, I thought that might be a good, uh, or free time for me, that I could work on myself, prove myself professionally, personally. So at that time, I developed some interest in research. Um, so I went to the Kuwait University. I volunteered with the professors there. Uh, I worked on multiple research projects. Uh, I attended some courses in Kuwait and overseas, um, keep reading, um, and I was proving. So the point here that sometimes we, we get stuck. Uh, I'm sure some of you had like a similar situation like that and you didn't know what to do, you did everything you could, but things, doesn't, like, things don't go the way that you plan for. So, um, in these times, you have to make sure that you're still going up, proving, even if the system around you uh, doesn't recognize you, you promote yourself by improving, even in the most difficult time that uh, you're going through. So I did that, I worked on myself, I kept myself busy with the research projects, learning more uh, things professionally and uh, personally. And then a year passed, I reapplied again for the Kuwaiti program, and I was rejected again. <laughs> and I thought at that time it wasn't fair because I even improved my CV. I have more items, more research. Uh, I improved, but... Um, uh, again, I was rejected, and I asked one of the interviewers um, um, about the reason of rejection, and I was told that uh, because I have young children, they thought that I'm not going to be productive enough. Uh, so at this point, I uh, decided not only to leave uh, the workplace, but to leave the country. <laughs> So uh, I started to apply for postgrad programs, and I was accepted at Harvard. Um, so uh, before I now uh, tell you about my journey at Harvard, this was just an interesting conversation. So when I got the paperwork from Harvard, and I had to sign it uh, at the Ministry of Health uh, to work on my scholarship. So the same person who told me that you're not going to be productive enough, he had to sign my paperwork. <laughs> so he uh, got, I went to him and he started to read my acceptance letter uh, from Harvard and he um, told me that, um, and I thought uh, that you have children and how can you go to Harvard with your young children? I think you should apply to the weighty program here. And then I told him, yes, but I applied twice and I got rejected. <laughs> and then he told me, you can apply again and I promise this time I will, <laughs> I will accept you. And then I told him, no, thank you. I'd rather go to Harvard. <laughs> uh, it took him a while until he signed my paperwork, but I was so scared. Eventually he, he signed. So I went to Harvard. Uh, it was a new challenge, uh, a new culture. Um, challenge in a, in a good way, of course. Again, working in the same mindset, um, full potential, not only doing the requirements, but go beyond that. Um, I, I graduated on time with a doctorate degree, and uh, on the day of graduation, I was asked to, um, or I was offered a faculty position, because um, during my work at Harvard, um, 
I was, um, like I volunteered in many projects. I used every single opportunity to improve myself. Uh, I taught in classes, I helped professors, I was involved in several research projects. Um, I, was, I wasn't looking for this promotion or this um, faculty position, position. I never dreamt about it, but I just wanted to improve myself and move up. Um, I got the recognition, um, and it was from Harvard. Uh, after it, it was, I mean, it felt good because after all of that time, the pain and the struggle in Kuwait, and even at Harvard, even though it was different kind of struggle, I chose to work hard, but you, got the, you will get the recognition at the end, and um, it will be huge based on the pain and suffering that are, uh, you go through. Um, and then I returned back to Kuwait. Um, I start working on research projects between Harvard and <clears throat> uh, at that time I was working at the San David Institute. Uh, they were very supportive. Uh, and these days were the best days of my life. I felt that um, finally I'm recognized, I'm doing the things that I like. I was publishing papers, working with professors at DDI, Desman, and uh, Harvard. Um, and um, so sometimes if you feel that everything is going well for me, I'm not used to that. So <laughs> I, I could have stayed at that level, um, doing the things that I like, uh, producing publications, but uh, I want to uh, pursue a higher level and I felt that I need a new challenge. So um, in, in research, usually you start with a junior researcher and then uh, you become an independent uh, researcher. You, you have some idea or, or a new discovery uh, that you want to uh, uh, a patent or something that you want to invent. So I wanted to do that. So I had an idea, I wrote the proposal, I received the grant. It wasn't easy um, to, um, some researchers here know how difficult getting the grant is. I got some grant for the United States, um, some from uh, Kifas, this man. Um, I um, assembled a team, um, experts, senior researchers, researchers in Kuwait also, and I started my research. Uh, so again, um, going up really comes with a price, so I was expecting some kind of uh, challenges. So the um, challenge here is, was that uh, one of the uh, senior researchers that I was working uh, with uh, at the United States, um, he saw how significant this research was and wanted to take ownership of uh, this research. And uh, he started to uh, control the research, uh, to take credit of my work. Um, so I didn't know what to do. This was a new experience for me. I was told by um, my colleagues at the Institute that usually uh, does that with um, international researchers who were turned over their visa, or especially women from the Middle East. I, he thought that uh, women cannot speak up for themselves, things like that. Uh, and they actually advised me uh, not to fight him because he was so powerful uh, and he might ruin my career. But I decided to fight. I wanted to take this uh, battle because um, it was my work and I have all the evidence that this my, was my intellectual property and my research. So I took this battle and I fought, I stood up for my research. Um, it was a long story, uh, Dr. Sadun uh, supported me with that, um, he knows the story. So then um, eventually uh, I got my ownership of my research back, um, I he actually, if I, he was found liable, he was in trouble eventually. Um, now I'm working with high caliber scientists, um, I have access to Nobel Prize winners for my research. We started, it's an ongoing research. We had great results. And eventually I won the UNESCO L'Oreal uh, Award based on the result, the result that I have from the research. Uh, so imagine if I would listen to other people who told me to just um, give up and work under him, 
because it would ruin my career or uh, it would uh, cancel my visa or whatever, um, I wouldn't have this L'Oreal Award. So sometimes you have to fight, you have to stand up for your values. So, um, so yeah, um, I think this was a happy ending. I would like to conclude with two important messages. Uh, first, that pain and suffering um, are inevitable for anyone who wants to uh, move up the ladder and uh, succeed. Um, there are two kinds of pain, pain that you choose and pain that you don't choose or you don't control. Uh, the pain and suffering that you choose is uh, the hard work. Uh, you choose hard work over pleasure, for example. You work on the weekend. So most of us uh, are average on things that we do, but if you want to excel, if you want to be exceptional, you have to dedicate a great amount of uh, time, effort, and energy to be really exceptional at anything. There's nothing wrong about being average if you do the right thing, but if you choose to be exceptional, you have to work for it, you have to earn it. Um, and the other kind of pain is the, or suffering is something that we don't choose. Things like failures, being rejected, uh, being sometimes being frozen, uh, stuck in your workplace, you don't know what to do. You do the right thing, but like, there is no recognition or no support. Uh, at that time, you have to still move up. Uh, don't complain, don't just wait for the opportunity to come. You have to improve yourself, move up until the opportunity uh, comes and it will come and you will be ready at that time. Like for me, uh, when I was stuck in Kuwait, um, I just went to the Kuwait University, I worked with research, I improved myself. When I applied to Harvard, I didn't expect that I'll get it, but um, I got it because I was ready at that time. I have research components in my CV and Harvard uh, is looking for that. Um, the other um, value that, uh, or the other thing, the other message I want to leave you with is uh, to define our value and our um, identity. Um, it's important that um, we, we have something we stand up for. Uh, we um, build our uh, internal peace and inner support system. So we can move on during the difficult time. We um, should keep our mental, emotional health um, strong and solid so we can keep going. Uh, this is how we charge our battery. Uh, for me, uh, I'm a person of faith. I, uh, I am a strong believer that if you work hard 100% to your fullest potential, your fullest integrity, uh, you will get the reward. Even if the system around you doesn't recognize you, God recognize your, your heart, your sincerity, your hard work, and you will be tested. It might come late, but you will be rewarded, and the reward will be and um, uh, this is the end of my story. Uh, I hope you uh, find, it, and find it interesting, and I hope that I can give some hope to the people uh, who are going through some hard time. Uh, and I would like to end with uh, some good news. I just uh, got a promotion at Harvard. So in Harvard, we, have, um, we start with lecturer, and then an instructor, and then professor. So I was promoted to instructor now and uh, I got a new role program director of the dental public health uh, <coughs> so I enter and advise a PhD and master students in the department um, thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions thank you so as uh, you mentioned, your father was in the military. As someone who is in the military with young daughters at home, <laughs> to what degree do you attribute your father's upbringing to your success today? Um, so I would say more than 70%. So I believe that um, the discipline that we had shaped my personality. Um, again, I, I don't know now, I'm not interested when I sit with like 
even my cousins and friends are talking about the, the brand names or plastic surgeries. Now everybody's talking about that makeup. I'm not interested. I'm not saying that I'm not critical. Maybe you can see I have some, but um, like I have bigger things. And I just was talking with Yam days ago. <laughs> she was telling me that about like she's sitting in the, in the gathering and they were talking about Rari uh, Armudan with Tartar. <laughs> and like, I, I felt that I'm not, I don't belong, and I told her, yes, me too. Sometimes I sit and they talk about all this kind of stuff, and I'm busy with my research, my things, but sometimes I have to, I have to sit with my family, of course. But um, it was the way that my father raised me. Uh, he was on top of me on everything. Like, let go of the, the reading and the schoolwork, the, the, the discipline itself, the routine. I think it's very important to... Uh, value the time, wake up in the morning, early in the morning, and do the work, and um, not wasting my time on TV or um, uh, even, uh, again, I, I go out with friends, I do fun stuff, but I have to make sure that I finish my work, and then I reward myself, so I enjoy it later. But yes, I think parents, the role of parents in raising their children um, is very important, the key, actually, to success. Because if just let, let them do whatever you, they want. They're young. They, they need some discipline, control. Uh, and then they can choose whatever they want when they grow up. Question? Do you discipline your children? <laughs> I expected this question. Uh, I do my best. I'm, I'm busy, but uh, again, I, I don't let them watch TV. Um, on like I not like the because the way uh, that we were raised I think it was extreme so um, for example I take all the social the, all the electronics uh, at 9 uh, 9 p.m. and they complain they tell me you're the only parent who's doing that everyone else uh, don't and uh, again no TV no Netflix I let them sometimes when they finish their homework but I give them like certain time, like two hours a day, that's it. Um, I'm, again, food from outside also, I have a rule that no food from outside. <laughs> they can cook themselves. Um, my children now are in, in the US, um, so we don't have a maid. Um, like everyone has something to do. One has to wash the dishes or laundry. So I, I kind of doing the same thing, but not as the extreme. And I think they are responsible. Uh, I don't have to be on top of them on uh, homework. They can do everything by themselves. Uh, yeah, I, I think this also, because I saw how this helped me, so I'm trying to do the same thing with children as well. Um, thank you, doctor, for uh, your talk. And it's, it has touched me uh, sincerely. Um, my question is, how did you overcome your fears and uh, you went ahead and as an introvert, you felt comfortable in, in challenging uh, the people that came across you. It takes a lot of uh, guts to do it, to be honest, to, uh, to be able to uh, overcome your fears and uh, take, take them head on. So I, I can't imagine you as an introvert, you know, going through this uh, tormenting uh, mental stress. So what made you be able to, uh, to go through this? I mean, that's, that's the biggest question I have. Um, so a good question, because being an introvert, sometimes people underestimate you, because uh, I don't know, are you introvert? Or? OK, so you know that uh, we don't talk much. We work, but we don't talk much. So sometimes when you're silent or quiet in the meeting, people think that um, they underestimate you. They sometimes they take over your work or uh, they, they, they don't take you seriously. So I think this was my problem. But in the same time, um, we are very particular in our work. So we go by the book. We want everything to be perfect. And if uh, or someone um, uh, like step on our property, then we turn to some someone else, right? So um, 
I, I don't like to give up. Also, some kind of my personality, and again, I would give to my father. He wants us to be strong. Uh, even if we had some problems in the school, he would tell us, I'm not going to go, you go, take uh, stand up for yourself. So, um, it, it isn't easy sometimes, you need support. Um, even, so for me, I, I had good support system uh, from colleagues and friends. Sometimes even if the, my boss didn't support me, I had other people support me. So um, I came to realize that having good uh, like connections or building good um, um, uh, support system is important. So in this time, you can work with people. You. Does this answer your question? Thank you so much, Hind, for sharing your inspiring journey with us. Uh, it's very motivating, and uh, I think all of us here will have a few things to share with your journey in terms of the suffering and the pain we have to go through. And congratulations on your success uh, at the end. So I just have one question now. With your new appointment as the program director, reflecting back on your journey, and then you had an issue with the program director here in Kuwait, and then with the residency program in Kuwait. Now, if you see yourself as a program director, how would you do things differently? Like you are the same person that got rejected by the program director years ago. And how would you do it now? Um, you mean working with them or? Um, yeah, do you think you've learned something and as a new program director, you would do things differently nowadays? So first, um, I think we, we need some criteria for evaluating the, the applicants, for example, because the way that they do it now, I don't know if they changed, but maybe 10 years ago, um, it was very subjective, right? So if, if I don't like you, I won't accept you. We need more solid criteria or evaluation criteria to accept the applicants, <clears throat> not based on if I am a woman or... Um, like family name or these uh, things. So there should, should be solid criteria for evaluating the applicants. And um, other things like, um, yeah, so are you asking about the, the accepting candidates? Yes. Uh, or, yeah. Actually, now uh, I'm working with them, so I don't, I'm not uh, resentful or anything. <laughs> they actually invited me to teach now, so I'll be teaching research workshop with them. So I don't have any problem. I, I like to help. And not because one person did something to me, this means that everybody is bad. So I'm sure they are good people. Um, and like, again, sometimes I... I give him, or maybe maybe because he worked with uh, other women who weren't productive, so he had the stereotypes that all women aren't productive. Um, he's an old man now. I, we can't change him. <laughs> but maybe we should um, educate people about uh, these things, um, especially young generation, like uh, stereotypes or the stigma that we still have about women. Thank you very much for uh, your speech. I think it's important to actually identify. I'm not sure if this is a question or a statement, because at the end of the day, you know, what the new generation lacks is probably the sense of achievement, the drive, because uh, as you said, I mean, they're interested in things that are superficial. And it doesn't actually bring value or it doesn't bring gratification. So I think, in a way, if we turn it into a question, what would you suggest to actually bring this value or sense of achievement uh, to give the people the, uh, the sense of, uh, I guess, joy? I guess. Joy comes from the sense of achievement, I guess. So what, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, so uh, we just had a meeting a few days ago with uh, Dr. Khaled Al-Fadl, uh, the Director General of Kifaz, and he was talking about the same thing. Uh, he was thinking to get some kind of platform for a young generation, young, junior researchers to give them 
the motivation or the drive to um, improve or uh, because now we're seeing some kind of disappointment in the area uh, or uh, some like uh, young generation, high schoolers or uh, uh, in the professional level as well. So uh, maybe things like highlighting uh, the successful people or people who have values we talk about in the media because sometimes the negative media might dominate so maybe uh, successful people also be in the, the this platform and talk about the success so we can motivate young generation provide more values okay thank you very much for listening and it's my pleasure being here thank you